What's up, guys? Today we're going to be talking about Cha-Ching! The Darkness That Comes Before by R. Scott Baker. Now, guys, this is book number one in the Prince of Nothing trilogy, and really this is like the beginning of the second Apocalypse series. Um, this has been a long time coming for me. Uh, I've been wanting to get into this for years. I've been kind of intimidated because I did know that it was, you know, kind of massive in scope, um, kind of one of my weaknesses. Um, but yeah, I, I've just heard such good things about this. Um, but I did wait, and I'm glad. I'm glad that I got some experience under my belt, um, that I waited till I leveled up before I really got into it. Because after getting into it, oh, oh, let's get into it. So the darkness that comes before is split into five different parts. Uh, it also has a prologue. Now, I do think this is important to the story structure. Um, and also, guys, I just want to let you know this will be a lengthy review because I am going to talk about what we're establishing, as for, like what's going on, who we're dealing with in each part. Um, I think if I don't, it's somewhat doing a disservice to this book. I don't think just saying hey, this book's about a holy war and then talking about, you know, my feelings on it. I just don't think that is enough for this book or this series. So just I just want you to buckle in. I will be doing this spoiler free. So do not f like freak out about me going, you know, touching on narratives because I will keep it plenty vague. I, I do think we all need the understanding. This is a big old massive thing, guys. And I do think it can be intimidating to people uh, or people might drop out of it because they're, they're having a hard time. So this review will help kind of shine a light on the, the story structure, of what's going on, what we're establishing, and then also going into thoughts and feelings. All right? All right. So right out in the prologue, Baker hits us with a killer line. One cannot raise walls against what has been forgotten. Now, this is not just fancy. It's also something for the reader to keep under their hat. Now, moving forward in the prologue, we will learn that there was an apocalypse. And during the height of that apocalypse, a high king named Anasarimber fled with his family to a safe haven known as Ishwal. Now, nobody knows of Ishwal. It's a secret place. So he and his family should be safe. But we find out they're not safe. The plague strikes. It destroys the family. But the bloodline goes on because we find out that there was a bastard son. So the Anasarimber bloodline does move on. And our young survivor comes across other apocalypse survivors, but these are really not normal people. We do get their name, but not much else. They're known as the Dunyain. Now, the prologue does fast forward from here. We'll pick up many years later. And what's going on is we, we're, we're introduced to the character of Kellis and a Sarimber. And now Kellis is making his re-entry to the world of men because he has received a dream. Uh, Kellis and the Dunyane received a message from Kellis's father, and he's telling them, like, he wants Kellis to come find him. So Kellis re-enters the world of men from seclusion, and it's kind of disorientating at first. But then we begin to understand that Kellis is different from other men. We will see that. The prologue will continue to pull the reader in, and right there towards the end, it'll kind of confuse you and then move on to part one. In part one, we really start to establish a lot of things. We will establish the three C's and the schools of sorcery, and particularly the school of mandate. Now, the interesting thing about the school of mandate is all the sorcerers share a dream, one from the past that's filled with prophecy. So every time these guys are going to bed, they're sharing this dream, and it's really made them paranoid. Um, it's made them par paranoid enough to be one of the only people left in this world to still believe in an old threat known as the consult. Now in part one, we also establish an investigation set by the School of Mandate on the Thousand Temple's new Shriya leader known as Maithanet. Now the Mandate's reasons for this investigation are kind of multiple. One, they're always worried about the consult, but the other one is Maithanet is threatening to wage a holy war, and the schools kind of want to know, 
is he going to wage it against them? Now, part one will also start to establish a lot of the beliefs of the Inrithi people, um, because there, this is a, quite a few factions that have these beliefs. And we will find out that sorcerers are looked at like heretics and unclean, um, as well as it just starts to flesh out just a lot of other characters and just the political and um, religious beliefs here in this world. So we will find out about Mathanet, his holy war. We will also establish characters like Esmanet, who is a prostitute, and also a love interest to Akamian. We will also um, establish uh, a couple different past students of Akamian's, ones he's trying to tap for information about his investigation, one of note being a prince named of Proyas. The investigation will reveal that Mathanet is going to war, but it won't be with wh who everyone thinks he's going to war with. It's not exactly, it's not against the schools. It's against the Phantom Empire. And this is actually a huge deal. And the Akamian knows that holy hell is about to break out. Now in part two, we really establish the imperial family of the Nansur Empire, primarily Zarias III, his nephew Confus, um, his mother, and as well his advisor Scaeus. Now part two really does flesh out these imperials um, and their like motivation. We do get to see the concoction of the, what is known as the Vulgar Holy War, and this is really a plot that's been cooked up by Scaeus and Zarias, his mother and his nephew, to gain a better foothold in the real Holy War. We will watch people be used as cannon fodder to gain this better foothold. Um, and it is pretty dastardly. We, we will find out that these Imperials are very greedy. They are filled with avarice, but they are also very intelligent. Part two will also establish this vulgar holy war that has been concocted by the Imperials. We will actually get to see this play out some when we watch Confus lead an army to battle against the Skilvendi barbarians at the Battle of Cayuth. Now, this is an important battle, one surely to remember, but also this is where we are introduced to our Skilvindi barbarian, Nair. Now, Nair is a chieftain of the Utamit tribe. He is a very skilled and feared warrior. But we will also come to find out that he is maybe just not very appreciated amongst his folks, his people. His kinsmen seem to be having a problem with Nair, and they're taking it up with him right on the battlefield. Um, and it just seems to be the most inopportune time. Now in part three, we will be reintroduced to the character of Esmanet, but this is really where we establish Esmanet. Like I said earlier, she is a prostitute, also a love interest to Akamian. Um, so when we pick up in part three, essentially Esmanet is dealing with a lot of fallout that has been happening with the events throughout this book. Um, this propels Esmanet to go and seek out Akamian. Now, along the way, this journey is just not exactly a good one. Uh, Esmanet is a prostitute. They're not really looked at very highly, so it's somewhat of a dangerous journey. And along the way, it's kind of confusing, a little bit to the reader. I have to admit, this was a little confusing to me at first, but it does, does start to make sense. Along the way, Esmanet just seems to come across strangers who have a strange interest, not only in her, but her knowledge of Akamian. Now in part four, we're reintroduced to the character of Kellis Anis Arimber, and he's still very much on mission, trying to find his father. Along the way, he will cross paths, and we will be reintroduced to the character of Nair, our Skilvindi uh, barbarian of the Utamit tribe, and what plays out from here is very interesting, because we will be, we basically will establish a connection between these two characters. Um, they will have to form a relationship, one that's got plenty of animosity there, um, but they will travel together. And this kind of uh, establishes the Ajunti Steppe, um, as well as some other parts of this world. And it'll also establish another character, and that is Serway. Serway is a concubine, and essentially this character will kind of play an integral role as far as she really gets put in between these two male characters and adds quite a bit of tension between them. So in part five, we really start to make our connections. At the end of the book, guys, it's not going to be all buttoned up. This is a trilogy, and it goes on to into a series. So don't expect to have everything solved here at the end of book one. But by all means, we've make, we're making our connections. Our points of contact are coming together. 
essentially what happens is everybody we've met along the way is all in the same place. And what is playing out from here is a, like this big argument. It's almost like a trial because what they're trying to basically decide is how to move forward in this holy war. There's lots of decisions to be made here and a very colorful cast uh, of players. Um, at the same time, this final part of the book will also establish a very sinister threat, one that not everyone is expecting. So one of the first things I want to get into should not be a surprise. It's going to be Baker's writing style. Now, Baker has a powerful prose. It's got muscles, um, it's, and it's strong, and it hits hard. But it also will make you work. I do think that not everyone can just jump into Baker. Like I was saying earlier, this is something that I think you need to work your way up to. His prose, it's not so like metaphorical that it's crazy. It's just, it's got strength and he delivers the story in a different way. His writing is so much different than other fantasy that I've consumed because he doesn't have a normal narrative exposition style. And what I'm talking about there, guys, is he doesn't say like, hey, here's the world, here's the details, check them out. No, instead, he makes you do a little work. You got to get to know these characters because that's how you're going to get to know the world. Through character interaction, through their perspectives, through the politics, through the religions. <sighs> what all this does is it immerses you in the story. It takes it from being a fantasy tale and makes it a real fucking thing. And that is where it gets amazing. And that's why I was just so impressed. Um, and a lot of his stuff can build and just, man, the payoff is amazing. I want to keep with this writing style and work into his action because it's once again delivered differently. I know this sounds a little pretentious, but he has an artful way of delivering his story. Um, the Battle of Cayuth is by far my favorite of all time. And it's not because he painted this picture that was a blow for blow, detailed, uh, graphic, like graphically violent scene. No, he just, he, he, he has like a tempo, like a tempo and a pace to his action. He builds the scene. It's like a wave that builds and it builds so big. And then right before it crashes, there's nothing you can do, but just enjoy it. You know, <laughs> like when I, I was there on the, on the battlefield at the battle of Cayuth, guys, that's what I'm trying to say. When, <laughs> when Nair is watching his kinsmen fall on the field, he sees it. He makes a personal connection. Like, hey, there's so-and-so. I used to fish silver fish out of the river with them. And then he watches them fall and swords hacking them up. And it's just, at this point, it's not just like somebody falling on the battlefield. It's a fucking tragedy. And it hits you in the heart. It's got all this emotional charge to it. And it's just whew, amazing. And I know it sounds like I'm blowing all kinds of smoke and kitten kisses and sunshine up your asses but I'm telling you the truth that this writing really blew me away but I also understand that it is something that probably most people will have to work their way up to the next thing I want to talk about is just the themes and the concepts that Baker is hitting you with throughout the book because I do think that he's leaving you breadcrumbs from beginning to end. I know a lot of people say that this is a very philosoph uh, philosophical book. I don't know enough about philosophy to really talk about that with you guys, um, but it is very introspective. It will make you think. I think there are some things. I think that some people will pull more out of it than others. It might be one of those your your mileage may vary kind of things. Um, but personally for me, the things I took out of it, a big one was cause and effect. And I think that that had something to do with the name. Like I said, I just think Baker was hitting me with that one a lot. And a big one part about it, guys, was just, um, you know, the cause always comes before the effect. The effect never comes before the cause. Therefore... The effect really can never tell the cause what to do, so to speak. Now, I might just be brain farting, but that's really what I felt Baker was hitting me with. 
You know, as well as you could say, there's a lot of elements of transhumanism in, in here going on with the Dunyane and Kellis, you know, and that's interesting because then we start to wonder, you know, during their his interactions with other people, you know, you go, man, is this something that, you know, human beings should think about getting rid of? Or is that just what makes us inherently human um, as well as just working off of this? is several times while reading this it just really does start to feel sometimes like a like a story of the human condition you know there's so many people there's so many religions beliefs magics and lores and everything in this world it's so rich and broad and massive um that yeah you get all these perspectives and it's just amazing now i also want to take a minute and touch on some of these characters not a whole lot because i do want you guys to kind of really figure them out for yourselves um, but I do have to just mention that Baker did an amazing job at fleshing some of these guys out, um, especially, let's just say, Kellis. Kellis Anna Sarimber is probably one of the most intriguing characters ever written that I've read. Um, the, the amount of mystery that kind of surrounds his bloodline and just him as a person. We'll get to know Kellis throughout this story, but we will still have quite a bit of mystery about him. And I loved this. I thought that the way that Baker did it was just amazing because it didn't make me feel like I wasn't getting enough. It made me like instead it was just let like it got me just enough to kind of continually be intrigued. I just want to know more about Kellis. The other thing is uh, his character of Nair. Now, Nair is a badass. You know what I mean? He's brutal. You know what I mean? He is a perfect tribal warrior. But he's also scary as shit. He's horrible to women. Um, and yeah, so I'm just saying it's like, in all reality, this is a very scary man. But because of Baker, he made him interesting and entertaining. And I, you know, this was one of my favorite characters out of the book. And that was nuts to me because some of his, you know, behavior. <laughs> as well as I want to talk, touch on some of his characters from the Imperial family. Primarily, uh, you know, um, Zarius III and Confus. Now, these guys will probably get a lot of hate because they are assholes. They're greedy assholes. But they're also so intelligent. These are men that also act very believable. They act like men of their station, like without a doubt. And that's something I love about what Baker did with his characters in here. He didn't make any compromises. He didn't give you characters that are cool. Um, he gave you real characters. So he gives you a real world and fills it with real scary fucking people. Now it's really easy to see. I like it a book. So I think it's important to take a minute and be objective. Let's talk about some stuff that maybe is not so good or shiny about this book I'm gushing about, right? So I think the main thing that would turn a lot of people off is just really the treatment of women in here. Um, and also just the fact that the main character or the women female characters, the focus characters are all prostitutes or concubines. Um, women get a rough go in this world. And I understand that some people might argue, you know, hey, this is just the reality, the hard, hard, harsh reality uh, for women, especially. And that maybe they don't have any uh, options. They're going to be prostitutes no matter what, because that's just the way of the world. OK, but then we also get to the character of Esmanette and her personality, her behavior is that of a prostitute, guys. <laughs> so, I mean, I could see where people would. There's probably going to be some people just kind of upset, maybe about the handling of the female characters. But most assuredly, I could see people getting upset just about the, the tr just, the, you know, what women go through here in this book. Another thing I could see people maybe getting tripped up with is this is a massive, massive story, guys. Um, one of the reasons why I tried to do that narrative breakdown is because, like, so much stuff is going to get thrown at you. But this is a big subjective con because surely some readers will get hit with all these names, all these factions, all this stuff, and they're just, like, overwhelmed going, oh, my God, this guy's just throwing stuff at me nonstop. Um, there is that. So that could deter some readers. But there's the flip side of that, guys. Trust me, there are readers out there that are taking all this stuff that Baker's throwing at them, and they're just like Pac-Man. They're just, um, nom, 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 nom. they're loving it. So it's a pretty subjective con, for, you know what I mean? Because also, this is epic fantasy. Expect to have a lot thrown at you. This is one of the biggest 
biggest worlds with like the richest history and just a massive, massive scope. So that could, you know what I mean? As much as that's like interesting to some, could deter others. Um, another one just being, you know, there is a quite a bit of sex and there is a dark tone to this book. It's not as dark as I thought it was going to be. I've read darker. But the series could end up being um, quite a bit more sinister for sure. But either way, it's just, it certainly has a very serious tone. There's n Don't be looking for humor. This is, a, a, like I said, this is one of the most realist fantasy tales I've ever read. But that real tone comes from it being dark and just all the dastardly shit that happens. So that might be too much for some as well. Now, as far as my two cents for the slow and the struggling, when it comes to the struggling reader, I just say pump your brakes and don't do it. This is not what you're not ready for a baker. If you're struggling as a reader, you need to get some experience under your belt. Level up, like I said, become a stronger reader, you know, get in that reader gym, start doing some push ups, guys. Um, because Baker has that powerful prose, and if you can't hold the weight of this story, you'll probably fall in that camp of condemning the book, uh, being like, oh, it was bullshit. But when it really wasn't bullshit, it's amazing, and you just weren't ready for it. So I'm just going to flat out say, don't do it. I never say that, <laughs> but I will for this one. Just get out there, get your muscles uh, your reading muscles built up before getting into to Baker because once you do you will thank me because then you get to digest it properly slow readers man I'll tell you if you have no struggles and you're even like man I'm only gonna read like a handful of books in my entire life well this could be worth putting in that lineup if you're only gonna read 12 books in your entire life maybe Maybe this one's worth it. I would say, you know, this this book and the way that the series is shaping up, it certainly has enough elements there to be like that mega series that people go to like. It's that hill they go and die on. It's their Malazan or whatever, you know. I could definitely see this being like that huge for some people. It is certainly becoming that way for this guy. Uh, I'm having a hard time not jumping straight into it. Um, so hard of a time that uh, I did just just jump straight into the next one. <laughs> anyway, um, so yes, yeah, slow readers. This is worth your time. If you want something epic and massive and large grand scale, serious in tone and just God damn badass. Yeah, sure. It's worth your time. <laughs> All right, guys, as always, thanks for spending some time down here at the channel into R. Scott Baker. Holy shit. I think that's all I need to say. <laughs> all right, guys. I got to get out of here. My camera's dying. As always, man, just thank you. And if you're new, please like and subscribe. It really helps grow the channel. As always, peace.